So, like I said, the first thing we're going to do is something you guys are actually just going to watch for, uh, unless you are setting up your own SD card and then follow along. Um, like I said, the SD cards that come with the Raspberry Pi are essentially the brains of the machine. This is where you have to load the initial operating system image. So if you've ever set up your laptop or something before, you normally do it by sticking in a CD, you boot to the CD, and you use that CD to install the operating system to the hard drive. The Raspberry Pi has no CD drive, right? It doesn't really have the capabilities to do this. So we essentially have to pre-format an operating system onto one of these SD cards before we can boot the Raspberry Pi for the first time. If you just put a blank SD card in the Raspberry Pi and try to turn it on, nothing's going to happen. So you actually have a couple of choices in terms of what operating system you want to use. Most of them are Linux-based. There's actually one non-Linux option uh, called Risk OS. It's another, it's Unix, so it's still Linux-like. But most people are using Linux on the Raspberry Pi. That's actually one of its main strengths. If compared to some of these other systems, like an Arduino, where you're working directly on top of the chip without an operating system in between you, having an operating system like Linux available buys you a lot in terms of getting up and running quickly. Because now you have existing software that you can use. You have, a, I mean, a lot of the work's been done for you. You can program in almost any programming language you want. As long as it has a Linux compiler, you can pretty much compile it down to the Raspberry Pi. Um, it's not 100% true, but it's more or less true. So you're not stuck with one programming language. You can use scripting, which you wouldn't be able to do on something like an Arduino. So if you're like Python, you like Perl, you like Bash, you just want to write scripts, so non-compiled programs, you can do that. Because now you have an operating system and an interpreter and all this other jazz. If you want to use Java, you can probably even use Java. I think Java is the hell spawn, so we won't be going over any Java in this class. But it is available if that happens to be your bread and butter. More power to you. Um, there are people, I'm sure, using Java on top of the Raspberry Pi. So when we go to set up this, if we go to the Raspberry Pi website, so the Raspberry Pi website uh, has a lot of information on it, although the most useful information is actually on a third-party wiki that also has a link on there. But on the download section of the Raspberry Pi website, you will find there's these series of operating system downloads. The one that most people are going to want and they'll be using for this class is this first one, this Raspbian. Raspbian is essentially Debian Linux, but designed specifically for the Raspberry Pi. So if you're used to using Debian or a Debian-like Linux, so this would be Ubuntu, this would be Mint, all of these Debian-derived projects, uh, you'll feel very at home in something like Raspbian. It's the same kind of, your package manager is the same, all of that. Uh, so this is what I recommend using for the class. This is what's already on most USD cards. This is what I'm going to be taking you through. There are a few other options if you want to explore them. And actually, there's options that aren't even listed on this page. But this is what most people are going to be using. So it's probably where you want to start. Um, so the first thing you want to do if you're going to go set up uh, one of these cards on your own, and again, no need to follow along unless you actually are setting one up on your own, is obviously you have to start by downloading this zip file here. Um, they also are giving us a SHA-1 sum, so this is a way of verifying that the download isn't corrupt, that our downloads actually worked. We'll go through using that in a minute. But so your first step would just be to go through downloading the zip file here. Uh, I already have it downloaded, so I'm not going to click through all these screens, but you would essentially go right here. I think it says this page will yep, start my download in five seconds. So you'd go ahead and download it. Once it's downloaded, um, you're going to want to make sure the download wasn't corrupt. So how you do this is kind of dependent, actually all the things with setting up the SD card for the first time are dependent upon what your host OS is. I'm using Linux on my laptop right now. If you're using Windows, if you're using OS X, uh, there's slightly different directions. OS X is pretty much going to match what I'm going to take you through right now. Windows is totally different. Um, if you want to know how to do it on Windows, there's good. If you go back to the download page, there's links to instructions on every possible operating system under the sun. Windows, they basically have a little tool that you just download and it does all of this magic for you. Um, if you want to do it on Linux or OS X, you do it kind of the older fashioned way, and that's what we'll be taking us through here. So I downloaded that image. Everyone read that? Cool. So I downloaded that image. Uh, I have that Raspbian zip file right here. So before I go and install this as an entire operating system, I'm essentially going to write all the data from it to this SD card. I want to make sure that nothing went wrong with my download. Because this thing went wrong with my download, obviously my SD card's not going to be right, my Raspberry Pi is not going to boot right. It probably won't break anything, per se, but it's certainly not going to work. And then you're banging your head against the wall to try to figure out why your Raspberry Pi didn't work. There's an easy way to rule out this possibility right now. So you saw on that website there was this long 
SHA-1 sum. This was on the other page too. So essentially what this is, is, well, that's kind of funny, it actually has a word in it. It's really funny. Um, what this is is a long string of letters and characters that is unique. It's a hash function that's unique to essentially the file we just downloaded. So there's, without going too much into the crypto, there's, uh, you essentially run the file you downloaded through a program and based upon the value of every byte in that file, it changes what this will be. So if something went wrong, if that file is not a byte to byte match to what it's supposed to be, when we go to recalculate this, the value we get the second time we calculate it won't match this. So this is kind of like a signature to make sure our file worked correctly. So we just have to go calculate this again and make sure it matches what's on the website. If it does, we know our download's good and we will move forward. So the command on Linux and Mac to calculate this is just SHA-1 sum and then the name of the file you want to calculate for. This is gonna take a minute to run. It's a semi-intensive calculation. Cool, so this is gonna spit that out again. Um, you could compare the entire thing. In reality, you know, if you just look at the last few digits and they match, you're probably good because the probability of these being the same when like that's different is vanishingly small. Um, so the last ones here are 6781. We'll just confirm. Yep, 6781. If I wanted to, I could check the entire thing, but it appears as though the file we downloaded is in fact the correct download. Nothing went wrong while we were downloading. Make sense? Okay, so again, Kind of Linux specific, but the next step would be I need to unzip that file. So on Linux, the command is just unzip. And because it already, I already unzipped it once, so it's going to ask me if I want to replace it, and I do. So this is going to go ahead and unzip. We'll let that go for a minute. Um, I'm now going to take my SD card. So you can use SD cards of almost any size. You probably want at least four gigabytes or above. You guys all have eight gigabyte cards, but anything above eight gigabytes, between eight and 32, should work just fine. If you get on the Raspberry Pi website, they have a list of like every SD card everyone's ever used and made work. So every now and then you'll get an SD card that's manufactured by someone that didn't do it quite right and it doesn't actually work with the Raspberry Pi. So if you want to be extra sure that you're buying an SD card that's known to work with the Raspberry Pi, you can get on the wiki. There's a whole list of them that's linked from the site. Um, but I also, if you look on the website, I have the one that you're all using tonight, and it definitely works too. So if you want to be safe, just buy one of those. You can get different what they call classes of SD cards. This basically controls how fast the SD card is. Um, to run something like a Raspberry Pi off it, you don't want the world's cheapest SD card because this is like your main hard disk for your little computer here. So you want something that has at least a little bit of speed. Uh, they recommend class 10 or above, so that's what you guys are all using. So if you want to go buy your own SD card, something between 8 gigabytes and 32 gigabytes, class 10 or above is the official recommendations. Um, so I have a SD card like that. This finished unzipping, so I'm going to go ahead and take my SD card and stick it into my machine. Linux is going to automatically pop this stuff up because I formatted it once, so I'm going to close those windows. So on Linux or Mac, we now have to do a couple of things. Uh, on Windows, again, there's a tool that deals with this for you, but if you're trying to do something like this on Linux or Mac, and this is the same thing the Windows tool is doing, it's just hiding it from you. Um, what we need to essentially do, when I plugged my SD card in, my computer already did what's called mount, automatically mounted it, so it essentially made it so I could go start working on it. We don't want to copy this image file to this disk just by like clicking and dragging. That won't work. You don't copy this to the SD card like you would copy to a USB stick. What we want, this actually contains multiple file systems on it, so we really want to do a very low level byte for byte write so that every byte in this file, just starting at the first available byte in the SD card, gets written right on top of it. And there's a special tool that you need to do that called DD uh, in Linux for, I don't even know what it stands for, I think it probably stands for disk copy or something and they just use DD as the abbreviation. Um, but this is a, what's essentially is a low-level copy tool. So if you took this image file, click and dragged it like in the GUI, and then tried to stick your SD card into the Raspberry Pi, it wouldn't work. Um, it's not going to do what you want it to do. Instead, you need this lower-level copy that really makes sure every exact byte gets written to the SD card exactly where it's supposed to be. Um, before I can do that, I need to, like I said, when I plugged in the SD card, my computer auto automatically mounted it. You always want to unmount it before you do a low-level write like this, because that just avoids, like if I were trying to copy to it manually right now by clicking and dragging, and then I went to do this, it would screw up all kinds of things. By unmounting it first, I ensure that nothing else can change the SD card while I'm trying to do this low-level write to it. So in Linux, the command's just umount. Um, Linux, 
all of your hard drives and things are under the slash dev label. So on Windows, this is kind of the equivalent like the C drive or the D drive. In Linux, they're all slash dev slash something, where at least on Ubuntu, your SD cards always start with this MMC label. So this is one SD card, MMC BLK0. That's the name of essentially my SD card. It has two partitions. You don't need to worry too much about that other than to know I just need to unmount both these. There's good instructions for all this online too, so don't worry if you're not following every step here, just get the general gist. So I need to unmount these that are already mounted, so I'm gonna give it the name, and the asterisk just means do both of them, so one and two, it's a wild card. So I'm gonna unmount those, and now I'm gonna actually run the command to do this copy. So. So to do a low-level copy like this, you have to be, do it as root. It's a privileged command. So again, in Linux, the sudo command gives you that privileged access. The command is then dd. This is the low-level copy command. Um, and there's a couple of parameters that this command takes. So bs is for block size. This basically says do the copy in chunks of this size. So I'm telling it to do it in chunks of 4,000 blocks. You don't actually need this, it's just performance enhancement. If you do it like one block at a time, it's really slow because it doesn't really take full advantage of how quickly you can transfer data. So this is just tends to be a good number to make it go as fast as it can. Um, the two things that do matter are the input file and output file commands. So input file is what I want to copy from, output file is what I want to copy to. So if is for input file, and that's that image file I just extracted. So again, not the zip file itself, but the image file that came out of it when I extracted it. And then my output file is going to be this block device here, so up to the zero. Um, so slash, that's output file, OF equals slash dev slash MMC. Okay, so now when I run this, it should start this copy. It's gonna take a few minutes. Okay, so it's going to ask you your password because it's a privileged command. And a space would be helpful. Cool. So DD is running. It doesn't give you any output. This is going to take, depending upon the speed of your SD card, this probably takes anywhere from 30 seconds to a few minutes. Um, so I'm not going to, we'll see if this completes while I'm talking, but if it doesn't, your SD cards are essentially what comes out when this command's complete. There's one more thing you have to do when this completes, and it's run a command called sync. That's the same as like when you're on Windows, when you right click on the USB driver, when you go to eject something, the sync command just ensures that all the data has actually been flushed down to the disk and isn't stuck in any buffers anywhere uh, before you eject it. So sync is the command line equivalent of saying, make it safe for me to eject this device. Um, so when this is done, you would just do sudo sync, and then you'd be good to go. You'd pop out your SD card, you guys all have those in your hands right now. You'd stick them in and life would be good. So again, to do this on Windows, uh, the commands are slow. It's not really a command, they have a program. You can download it from the Raspberry Pi website. There's more instructions on there. To do it on OS X, you can more or less do it this way. I think OS X also has a program if you want to make it even easier. To do it on Linux, you would definitely do it this way. There's no special program for Linux because they figure if you're using Linux, you don't need a special program. Any questions?